come before you, Lord. We step away from all the distractions of seasons. We come to ground ourselves in truth. Help us to know your loving prayers. God of life, as we begin our journey to the Advent season, open our hearts to the real joy of Christmas. Nothing compares to you, God. Nothing can satisfy our perfect long lives. Only the gift of Jesus and the hope for reconciliation is the beauty of Christ to us. The great anticipation of the gift of your unending love becomes to worship you.
Children's time, and I'd like to invite Ethan and Sammy up. They're going to do the first Advent reading together. Does somebody want to help a little girl up back here? One of you guys want to go help her down?
the first one is that you guys all got a card when you came in the door to sign and make a little note for Reverend Larry who's at home ill. So in his recovery and in his in the support of our congregation, we're going to wrap around him and write him little notes that will be delivered before Christmas. Just wishing him well and in his health and all those things that we wish for him. The next announcement is that there's a UTW potluck supper on Wednesday, December 5th at 6 p.m. And that's at the home of Bruce and Lois Scott. So please bring your favorite dish, a good appetite, and some meaningful memories of time with the UCW. Later this afternoon, we're going to be having an ecumenical lessons and carol service. So if you guys want to hang around and go get some lunch and then come back for our big carol thing, that would be lovely. There'll be people here from the Anglican Church across the road and from down the street at the Presbyterian Church. And we'll all sing together in between uh, lessons from, from the Bible stories around the nativity. Last but not least, Lisa, as part of the Belmont Community Singers, would like to remind you that there is a Christmas celebration concert on December 9th at 2.30 at Belmont United Church. So if you guys want to go to that, you can buy tickets. I'm guessing Lisa can tell you where to get those or buy them from Lisa. They're $10 or $12 at the door and students get in for free. Now I'd like to call on Lois Scott uh, for the presentation of new choir holders that have been dedicated in memory of Beth Lowe. Good morning. Well, this morning, I have a very special announcement to make. And it's on behalf of the Dorchester United Church Women, and also on behalf of Beth Will's son, Floyd Will, and Beth's daughter, Ruth Toretto. I'm very happy to present some lovely new choir folders to the church in loving memory of Beth Will, a well-known and well-loved member of both Kremlin and Dorchester United Churches. Beth was active and involved in many things, both in the church and in the community. She was a loyal and longtime member of the Common Choir for many years. Beth also played the church organ and taught the analyst. Beth was active in the local UCW. She was a charter member of the Common Unit and held many positions on the executive over the years. But as well as her church, Beth was a member of the local women's institute in the common area. All this, as well as being active on the farm with her husband, Edmund, and their family, Chloe and Ruth. We are all indeed grateful for all Beth Wills has given and shared with so many people over the years. Beth will always be remembered. I would now like to call on Floyd Will and Ruth to come forward and say a few words if you will. Floyd Good morning. Thank you. 
choir will do them justice. And uh, inside is a, a small card uh, in memorial of, uh, in memory of mother. And uh, we uh, were quite pleased to, to make this presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Dorchester ladies, uh, the UCWs, for their uh, contribution to award this as well. It's very generous of you, and uh, we do appreciate it as a family. Uh, we appreciate as a, as a family the opportunity to uh, to contribute toward this as well, and uh, thank all of us for her words. It's been a privilege to uh, to be part of this program. So, thank you. She's going to say something. I want to thank the people who have committed to carrying on the music tradition in the church too. It's so important. It's just so important to all of us, and I want to teach you. Thank you. To all of you.
Thank you to the choir and thank you to the Will family for offering such a beautiful tribute in loving memory of Beth. I can't think of a better way to celebrate something like it and every time the choir sings a whole that memory. Let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, we confess that we are not always willing to see others suffering or participate in our own. That we sometimes neglect our hurts, choosing to try and forget them instead of living fully into them. Instead of seeing others who suffer in our community, instead of calling on you to lift us out of the dark. Help us in our suffering. Remind us that you are with us in suffering and in joy. May we notice the ways that you are present, and may we always see you in the dark. Amen. We invite you to join me in reciting the new creed of the United Church. We are not alone. We live in God.
our worldwide community, sharing in God's love and hope. Amen. Before our God and Father. 
talking about every single one of us and our love and covenant with God. And in reference to our hearts, it's not that way we think of hearts in modern day English. It's a different kind of heart. The heart in this time is where you embody the core of love and of wisdom. So it's less an emotional thing and more this vast knowledge that he's praying. It is a prayer of hope. For Paul has fled, and we don't really know why, and the congregation he left behind is facing persecution for their Christian belief. Now most of the time, Christians in this day and age were just asked to pay homage to Caesar, to bring an offering to the emperor, and renounce their faith in Jesus. But there is an important point here of love within the faith community. And it embodies the way that we care for our community and care for one another. That communal suffering. Now nobody quite knows how Paul would wander into a random city that he'd never been in before, halfway across the known world to him, and start preaching the gospel. And he'd be standing on the street corner, and he'd be preaching to a crowd. And as more and more people would gather in, more and more people were exposed to the story of Jesus Christ. And it's kind of interesting because if somebody came in and stood in the corner downtown and started preaching up a storm, what would people do today? Makes me laugh to think about it. They might be out there all by themselves. <laughs> but this is kind of an interesting thing. He went and he ventured across the world. Now, the world at this time was only that small piece around the Mediterranean. They didn't know what was beyond that. There wasn't anything much that they knew of to the east, and there wasn't very much past the edge of the world at the Mediterranean and the, and the coast of Europe. So in this way, Paul's entering these new communities and bringing and forming people in the faith. And so what, however large this group is, this is very new to them. They don't know any of the background or the history other than the three weeks that Paul has had with them. And in that time, they have come together in this newfound thing, in this newfound hope, that in three short weeks they are now willing to die for. So there is an important point here about community, how they express that, how they visit one another and work together in their persecution. How they show respect, listening to one another and listening to the guidance of Paul. How they involve one another in leadership. Who do they elect as leaders of this community in Paul's departure? And how do they celebrate with one another? And in this letter, in this prayer, Paul has traveled from the Middle East, out of the Hebrews that have come from Africa, out of theologians that come from North Africa, in Egypt and across the top coast of Africa. All those different little sects of people, all those different tribes and cultures coming together from Africans, to the Middle Eastern, and then up into Turkey and Italy. And Paul, in a broad stroke of things, recognizes that we are all God's children. That God has added every Christian to the whole church. And I always think that bears repeating. Because he's adamant that God has added every Christian to the whole church. And it is in spite of or despite of differences in culture and beliefs and daily life, the color of their skin and what they have for dinner. In this early Christianity, all people are welcome and no one is left out. <coughs> There's an important thing too behind communal suffering. How do we come together as a group? How do we form groups in different ways? How does the United Church come together and break off into UCW and men's group and Presbyterian and 
Conference and National, how does the United Church of Canada become part of Protestant Christianity? How does that Protestant Christianity work its way into the big Catholic Church? And Catholic as the Church as a whole, not the Roman Catholic Church. How do we as Christians come together to celebrate our God? Our God that is the same God as the Jewish God and the same God as the Muslim God. As monotheistic culture, how do we come together in one big group, subdivided into many small groups? How do we show, share joy with sorrow? The United Church is facing an interesting time right now with churches in our body being allowed to celebrate and worship and minister in a way that removes God and Jesus from the picture. And how do we as a church and people suffer through that transition, suffer through that acceptance in knowing what that national church is deciding? Now, for those of you who don't know, there's a church in Toronto whose minister has decided to remove God and Jesus from the worship service. And it is, it's an interesting thing because all the ministers around are kind of buzzing with this decision that the Church of Canada has allowed her to continue practicing her ministry. And there was a very good article in the Vancouver Sun last weekend from a professor of mine at Vancouver School of Theology. And he is not a United Church minister, but he teaches United Church ministers or future United Church ministers. And his was an article of hope. Of hope that the new students that are coming in understand the gospel in a deep way and preach to God and to Jesus. And in their sharing of that suffering, they have learned something in this process of coming together as a community to understand so the church is the final decision. How do we share in suffering? How do we share in suffering so that we don't lose sight and become overwhelmed without joy? How do we reach out for God in the darkness? And there is something to be learned with how we suffer. And there is a bigger lesson in how we share that suffering what brings the people together? What fosters relationships and encourages us to share in our vulnerability? What have you been privileged with? Or when have you been privileged to have someone share their suffering with you? And you may ask me, what business does joy have mingling about with sorrow? But we don't know or don't you know, we like things black and white. A clear distinction between where we hurt and where we feel good. You know that our goal is to get out of suffering. When we feel bad, it's finding ways to make ourselves feel better. Because who likes dwelling there? But that goes against what we practice. That goes against water cooler antics of complaining about the boss at the water cooler, or complaining how long the preacher went on during the sermon while they have coffee time, or who said what against who. Or maybe it's something even more vulnerable. <coughs> maybe it's someone who privileges you with intimate secrets, those wounds that we tend to bury or cover with outer layers of cloth, band-aids. There are those moments where they beg to be revealed, where all that emotion and hurt comes pouring out of you and you just have to tell someone. And you can ask anyone, what do you know about suffering? And that is where they will tell you. Here is where I am hurting. Maybe I can show you those hard, hard truths of life that we can't always see. I couldn't be who I am because I was ashamed or ashamed in hiding myself. I tried to change who God made me to be. I can't cope with my anxiety and I cut myself to make me feel better. I was persecuted for the color of my skin, my background, my religion, my ethnicity, my gender, or my sexuality. Those moments when someone softly said, they hit me. 
small. They made me feel worthless. Or other times when it's a cry of I miss them so much. I'm so lonely. And isn't it miraculous when someone can step up and embrace you in that suffering? Isn't it miraculous when someone reaches out and says, me too? There is a bond. There is something we identify with in being heard, in being understood. These are the truths of our suffering. And we have all had to stare it in the face at one point or another. See, this is the mandate for responding to suffering. This is our call to commiserate with our neighbors, with our family, with our country, and with the world. Not to reject their suffering, but to embrace it. To pray with them and for them. Paul says, now may our God and Father himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his sins with all your community wrapped around you. And those times where we are broken and weary and hiding in the darkness of our suffering are the times we have to remember to reach up to God. Because we have a God that does not let our suffering pass unnoticed. We have a God that, who is waiting for our call. We have a God who decides this morning and every morning to love us who work in us in wonderful and miraculous ways. We have a God who brings people out of persecution. And it may not be instantly, but at some point if you look through the track of history, we have a man who goes to the edges of the world to preach the gospel to bring virgin people together into this new understanding. This new understanding of a Savior. He brings the word that brings us together in our suffering and reminds us that we are not alone. And this morning the people who have walked in the darkness will see a great light. For he has shone his light upon them. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us, and authority rests upon his shoulder. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he is the hope that shines out in the darkness to our suffering. He is the hope of joy, peace, and love. The hope that comes to us in a lonely manger. Hope that comes to us in the darkness. Hope that promises a love everlasting. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our Lord, thanks be to you and your Son. In your holy name we pray, Amen. Go in peace.